morning speaker, Brother Rolf Barnard from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, I do not know exactly what to say, except most of you as ugly as you were a year and a half ago. Some of you have improved a little. It's a pleasant surprise, a joy to be here. I don't know exactly why I am here, and so I won't say anything more. Your pastor and his wife came down to West Virginia the other day. I didn't get to the conference until uh, last night, and I bumped into him, and he reopened a matter that I had thought was buried, and I'm here, and I hope that I'll find out what I ought to do, and uh, you will find out what you ought to do, and we'll get this thing settled to the glory of the Lord. Now, I have not yet... I'm thinking some. I didn't... I didn't plan on being here. Thank you for this kind time. I always enjoy it. You're the hardest people to preach to in America. There's no doubt about that. I've been in lots of congregations where I thought maybe I had something to say to the people, but I have a terrible time finding out anything to say to you people that would profit you. You are a very peculiar people, and I use that word peculiar in the best sense of the word. Not many animals like you in this country, I'll tell you that, whether that's good or bad. But I certainly <coughs> would hope <coughs> that through your kind invitation, this dear pastor, that I might redeem the time this precious week. I'm thinking that beginning tonight, I'll speak all week on the contrast between belief and faith. I may touch on it this morning. I think the tragedy of America now is that everybody has such wonderful beliefs, but that faith is no more. There's a vast difference between believing some truths and faith. And uh, we desperately need to be men and women of faith. Your next door neighbor's beliefs are probably as good as yours. But belief is one thing and faith is another. We're not saved by what we believe. We're saved by where our faith is placed. There's a lot of difference. I'm not certain. I hope that we'll spend a pleasant week together. And I'm going to ask you to turn this morning for the morning service message to the book of Acts at chapter 9. Three times in the book of Acts we have the record. Three different times of the experience that Saul of Tarsus had on the road to Damascus. In the ninth chapter we have Luke's account, and then in uh, 22 and 26, 22, if I remember rightly, we have Paul. He he tells about it, and then again in 26, Luke, if I have my figures right. This passage of Scripture, the first seven or eight verses of Luke of Acts chapter 9, have always been very interesting to me for three reasons. First, We have the record here of the second greatest miracle the world has ever been called upon to deal with. First is the resurrection of Christ, and second, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Without doubt, the greatest single miracle since time began, saving the resurrection of our Lord, was the resurrection from spiritual death to spiritual life of Saul of Tarsus. The second reason this passage always been interesting to me is because we have the account here of the only time the Lord Jesus made a personal visit to an enemy of God. 
It's the only time. All of his appearances after his resurrection, according to the Bible, were made to his people, to his friends. But here, the one exception, when God broke the rule and made himself present, confronted an enemy of the gospel. Then the third reason I've been interested in this account is because 1930, I wrote a thesis when I was going to be graduated from a seminary. I always put that in there so you'll know I'm educated. And uh, But you had to write a thesis in order to get a diploma, a degree, whatever you call it. And I did what I have since come to understand but didn't understand at the time. I wrote and spoke and thought beyond my understanding. Now, that's the only time we do any real preaching, when we preach beyond our understanding. That's right. That's in the Spirit. That's in the Spirit. I have, in the few years I've been a preacher, preached things, and 20 years later I understood what I was preaching. It is so, but I didn't understand it. Now, that's not foolishness. That's so. So, and I wrote a thesis in which I expressed the conviction and elaborated upon it that we have two patterns, one in the Old Testament, one in the New, patterns of the way God saves sinners. One is Abraham and the other is Saul of Tarsus. And they're just exactly alike for both of them came into contact with a person. And that's the way people get saved, not by believing truth, but being confronted by a person. That person was the Lord of glory. In the book of Acts, chapter 7, I believe it is, we are told the Lord of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. And, of course, the Apostle Paul elaborates on the truth in the fourth chapter, isn't it, of the book of Romans, that we're saved like Abraham was saved. And Abraham didn't believe some truth. Abraham didn't believe what God told him. Abraham believed God. And there's a vast deal of difference. One is belief in some facts. And I believed every one of those facts while I was a professing infidel. The other is faith. Faith is always action. If God had told Abraham that the moon would have made was made out of green cheese, he never would have batted an eyelash because his confidence was in the one who was speaking, not simply in what he said. And that's what our Lord had in mind when he talks about, except you be converted and become as little children. Little child, until we teach him better, will believe what you tell him if he has confidence in you. Until <clears throat> we get to that place, that whatever God says, we believe it, not because we understand it, but because God said it, we believe God. And when the Lord of glory appeared to our father Abraham, yonder on those plains, he spoke, and he said, Abraham, get up and get, and Abraham got up and got. That's faith. Yes, a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus, at that time the greatest enemy of the gospel. The gospel is Christ, and Christ is a gospel. The greatest enemy of God in Christ was confronted by the same person who appeared to our father Abraham. 
And I want to mention three things that happened that didn't happen. They took place in this time when a man by the name of Saul going about making havoc of the church of God twisting people's spiritual arms to get them, if he might, to blaspheme against God, more zealous in the traditions of his fathers than all of his companions, taking a back seat to nobody in his consecration and his devotion to his faith. An all soul, all out man living for but one purpose to serve the God of his father. Something took place and he was a changed person. You better support your missionaries. You ain't got much longer to do it. Three, four more years, and that'll be a thing of the past. I'm prophesying. Because this world is being swallowed up in beliefs that we call faith. And the thing that's eating our nation and the world up is this simple fact that men and women change from N-O-N-O -no faith, T-O-2 faith, with then oh no change. America's more religious today than it's ever been. You folks have got more beliefs today. You got convictions sticking out of every one of your pockets. But so is your neighbor. He's got his convictions too. But convictions and beliefs and faith that do not radically make a new man with a new start and a new heart and a second chance and with a cause to eat and sleep and dream by and with is no good. And we are literally being consumed today by this awful fact. But if you'll start on a journey with a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus who was yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, he went up to the high priest and said, I want some letters. I'm going down to Damascus to the synagogues down there where the Christians were meeting yet. They'd show up at the synagogues, hadn't been run out of them yet said, if I find anybody down there of this way, this peculiar way of these fools that are going around here, claiming that that fellow Jesus is the Son of God, if we find any people who believe that to such an extent that it has introduced them into a way, for Christianity was not only experience in those days, it was a way of life instead of finding anybody down there that's translating their belief into faith, putting it into practice, living by it. Please, God prepared to die by it. He said, find any of those fools down there. He said, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to put handcuffs on them and bring them back to Jerusalem. And so he set out on the journey, and he got pretty close to Damascus, and something took place. Suddenly, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? All he's done is resting the people of the way, but 
this one who spoke to them said that he was in in that crowd too. And Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? Now, not to be smart, but that you'll get what the Spirit's saying here. I remind you that he says, Who art thou, Lord? And this word, Lord, simply means a term of respect. He had not the slightest idea who was talking to him. Just somebody that commanded attention and respect. Who art thou, Master or Rabbi or... We'd say VIP, very important person. Who art thou? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. He said, I imagine it must be mighty hard what you've been going through here lately. Must be mighty hard. Hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And Saul trembling... And astonished, said, and he uses an entirely different word, curious, Lord, God, not very important person, not a term of respect, but he found out who's speaking to him. He uses the term, Jehovah in the Old Testament and Curious Lord in the New. Who art thou? Very important person. I found out now. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It'd be a tragedy to live in the time appointed to you by God here in this time of probation and not experience what Saul experienced on this Damascus road. Three things took place. He found out now I want you to hear me kind of carefully now. He found out that Jesus was alive. Now, if you wouldn't get mad at me, your chances of winding up in hell are pretty big simply because you have to go from doctrine to experience. It's a whole lot better to go from experience to doctrine. The Apostle Paul is the one who wrote the pages of the New Testament to give us what we call the teaching, the Bible doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he had the advantage over us, brother. He'd met him. He knew what he's talking about. You see, it is desperately easy to be sound as all get out and wind up in hell. It is desperately easy to say, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and never have the slightest contact with him personally. And it isn't belief in a doctrine. It's faith in the person of whom the doctrine speaks that spells the difference between salvation and damnation. And here's a man as sound as he could be in what truth had already been advanced in his circle. He'd let you cut his head off if that would please the God of his father. But there's one thing he knew for certain. He knew that these fools that are going around all over the country stirring up trouble, claiming that that fellow Jesus, who was born under a cloud, all the best evidence was that his mother was a bad woman. 
And after all, he spent his manhood as a carpenter. And everybody that was anybody looked him over and said he won't do. And nobody but some prostitutes and fishermen and despised tax collectors and riffraff like that believed his claim. And after all, he was put to death in the most despicable manner that they'd ever been able to think of. Reserved for only the most despised and desperate criminal. And after all, nobody that was anybody had heard him or seen him since they put his body in a grave and put a seal of the Roman government on it, set guards to watch it. And if there's anything that anybody that had sense enough to come in out of the rain knew for certain, that was the last of that fellow Jesus. Now, Paul knew that. And yet, everywhere he went, he'd run around here arresting these fools that had some sort of religious experience or a dream or a vision or neurot got, got in a state of neuroticism and they were seeing things that weren't there and hearing things that weren't there and they were going around and saying, he arose. Oh, Paul said, Saul said, it's the last thing I ever do. I'm going to get rid of that bunch of fools. He is serious, folks. And he's going down to rest some more of them. And a light shined. In another place in Acts, Paul said, the light shined and the brightness was above the brightness of the noonday Damascus sun. And then he heard a voice, and he didn't know who the voice was. But in the providence of God, who's in the saving business, and who has to reveal himself to men since we can't find him out by searching, he stooped to reveal himself to Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of God, and said, I tell you who I am. I'm that despised fellow Jesus. Now, if he'd said, I'm the ascended Lord of glory, old Paul had said, I knew it all time. I knew that fellow wasn't the Messiah. But he said, no. He appeared in all his glory and said, you know who I am? I'm the fellow you've been going around here saying was not the Messiah. He identified himself. Paul found out he is alive. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could believe that and believe it enough to act upon it? It's either so or it isn't so. There's no in-betweens possible, is there? I've just got it into my head. And I started out as a young preacher and knew everything. Most of what I knew wasn't so. Didn't have sense enough. I think a fellow ought to be about 70 years old before they turn him loose now to preach to anybody. He ain't got sense enough, Brother Fuller, to say much for then. That's right. Until he's killed a few bears and been in the shades of Hades spiritually many times and walked the floor and the heavens of solid brass and no answer comes and he has to dig down between some nice little convenient beliefs and find out if he really got his foot on the rock at all 
I just bet you that's the most wonderful thing between the eternities. That our Christian is not based on a bunch of imaginations. It's based on the act of Almighty God. Who in a way that nobody can understand. In Christ Jesus humbled himself and became a man. All man. Not some sort of a ghost man, but a man. And that he's still a man. There's a man in glory. And that man in glory is head over all things under the church. I tell you what's fact. I wish for I die. I could live one day in the glow of actual faith. That that song tells the truth. Up from the grave he arose. Isn't that wonderful news? I charge you this morning to remember that you live in a land that takes that for granted. Taking things for granted will damn the soul of anybody. This is the truth of the gospel. This is it. This makes him unique. There is none other name. He has no rivals. He's the only one. Oh, my soul. What rivers of blessing could begin to flow on this religious doomed and damned nation? If the Spirit of God would be pleased to open our hearts, let some of the, the wonder of a risen Lord flow out to bless this world that's so full of beliefs and has no faith. He's alive. And then Paul found out something else. The second thing that Paul knew was, if there's anything on earth he is dead certain about, it was that that fellow Jesus was not the Son of God and God the Son. Now you tear with me a little bit. You are awful in danger of hell with your nice little beliefs and your little... Laws, you know, you ought not do this, and it's all right to do that, and all that religious fault are all. Now listen to me. You live in a country where our churches and people on the outside, from the pulpit on down, take for granted the death of the Son of God. Jesus died, Brother Kirkman, so what? Awful nice of him, wasn't it? Oh, yes, sir, brother, I believe Jesus died on the cross. Well, they believe it is a fact, but they don't have faith in it. Now, listen to me. There's one thing Saul of Tarsus knew. He knew that Golgotha's cross proved one thing. It proved that Jesus was a blasphemer. How? In the law of God, you have it in Deuteronomy 21, if a fellow commits a crime worthy of death and it's so terrible that you hang him on a tree, be sure to cut him down from that tree and bury him before the sun goes down. Don't let his body hang out to defile the earth. Why? God's curse is on everyone that hangeth on a tree. The one thing that proved to Saul of Tarsus that Jesus was not the God-sent Messiah, the Son of God, was the way he died. Anybody who believed the Old Testament law understood that God's curse was on anybody that hung on a tree. And you remember now that the cross of Jesus was a tree. One, two boards is a tree. 
And the fact that he was hanged on that tree proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's a blasphemer, that he wasn't what he claimed to be. Ladies and gentlemen, you better not just switch your gum to the other jaw and let this go in one ear and out the other. Young Spurgeon, when he's 13 years of age, wrestled way back before he was saved, wrestled with the biggest problem this side of eternity. How can a holy God have anything to do with me? This nation in and out of the churches is going to feel hell heavy because it has made a multiplication problem out of the death of Christ. Instead of having adoring worshipers, we got sound believers in certain theories. Hear me. Hear me. Under God, behold the mystery. Christ has redeemed us. From what? The curse of the law. How did he do it? God performed the miracle. He made Jesus to be a curse. So that the law still so anybody that hangs on a tree is under the curse of God. Behold him who knew no sin. He was made sin for us. Now, brother, that ain't something to understand. That's something to bow down in worship and adoration. There on that road to Damascus, by experience, Saul later could write, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How could it happen? Well, you couldn't do away with the fact. You, 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 you meet a fact in the road. You just well camped there. You can't get around it. And the law said, Curse! It is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And he's hanging there is Jesus. That means that he's under the curse of that's the gospel, brother. And ain't a man or one boy or girl yet and understand that. And long as you just try to understand it, there's no hope for you. But if it could bring you to the place you'd worship, oh, God. The only way on earth God could keep from bringing his just judgment on Ralph Barnard was to make a curse. God's curse out of Jesus Christ. You're living in a country now when everybody takes that for granted and there we have church people who believe some nice things and don't know what it means to worship or adore the Lord. I had a Jewish chaplain when I was in the army in the Second World War. He was one of the finest men I've ever known. Absolutely a gentleman. And uh, I was in trouble all the time. I was in the army with the uppers. And he always scotched for me and took my side. He respected me. And I'd help him out of tight sometimes. And uh, he'd do his best for me. He carried in his pocket a New Testament. Many of the Orthodox Jews do that now. And he said he faithfully read out of the New Testament every day of his life. Up in the little chapel where I, he's over here in this office, and I was over here. Up at the front was what we call the post chaplain. He sort of supposed to be the boss over us. The post chaplain was a Unitarian. He believed in Jesus as the Son of God, just like you and I or sons of God. He did not believe that in a unique sense that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God, like nobody else. Yet he claimed to be a Christian. 
And this Jewish chaplain often tells him, talk to me about his, his absolute, he just didn't, he just could hardly be civil to the Unitarian. He said, if I believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, I'd worship him and serve him till the day I die. And that Jew had it right, brother. He had it right. If I could believe that on an old tree outside the city of Jerusalem, the Lord of glory was made a curse by the Father for me. Well, that's the only way he could redeem me, buy me out of the clutches of the law. Brother, I'd worship him. And in a stumbling way, I guess, I know I'd serve him till the day I die. Paul found out one last thing. He found out that this risen Lord, who was made a curse, don't ask for our sympathy. He don't demand our admiration. He doesn't look for our assent. He demands our surrender. Oh, my soul, to call anything short of being confronted by faith, through faith in the gospel, with a person who's now alive, sitting on the throne, got there by way of that old bloody cross, Brother, there ain't but one response, and that's the one Saul made. You name it, what wilt thou have me to do? That's it. That's saving faith. Down in our country, we have Vance Havner. He's gone all over America these years, blessed man of God. I like to hear him tell the story when his little boy, he said, he got converted. He went to the old-fashioned mourner's bench. That's all they knew in those days. And that's better than nothing, I'll tell you right now. And he said he didn't know much about what went on. But he said when he got up, went out of that building, there's one thing he knew. He said, I knew I had a new master. Had a loot to ride the river with. Got a new master. Paul said, I got a new master. You just name it from now on out. <laughs> Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? <laughs> Let us stand.